Hey everyone, my name is Ryan Ellis and I'm going to be talking a little bit about my background and my story. I'm the son of an Episcopalian minister from Pennsylvania and a social worker from Yorkshire, England. Park, my dad, and Pauline, my mom. I grew up in Pennsylvania, was born in Pittsburgh in 1984. Spent two years there before moving to Rhode Island from 1986 to 1994. And then uh, moved down to Bradenton, Florida, a little bit south of Tampa from 1994 to 2002. After that, I went to college in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at UNC, go Tar Heels. Um, for a couple months into my first semester in college, met my business partner for eye contact, Aaron Houghton. And we started a company together that did email marketing software that helped small businesses and nonprofits manage their lists and communicate with their stakeholders. And that was called eye contact. And I built that contact for nine years with Aaron, up to 300 employees and up to $49 million in annual sales before being acquired by a public company called Vocus in February 2012 for $169 million. Over the past few years, I've also taken an active interest in Africa and development economics and began an angel investing fund called Humanity Fund. Humanity Fund invests in companies that are trying to make a difference in the world. And I particularly look for entrepreneurs, whether they be in Silicon Valley, North Carolina, Boston, New York, or Kenya or Uganda, that are using business to make a positive impact in the world. In 2008, I published a book through McGraw-Hill on entrepreneurship called Zero to One Million. And then, as I mentioned, I contact was acquired earlier in 2012. Now, I'm out here in San Francisco, California, from where we're filming today. And this summer, we've been building a new company called Connect. Connect is a mobile software company designed to help you visualize your connections, sort of like a CRM system, but for people rather than for salespeople. So I'm starting this new company, Connect, with my co-founder, Anima Sarah Lavoie. And I'm also starting an MBA, actually, next week at Harvard Business School in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm looking forward to uh, balancing the demands of working uh, and building a company in San Francisco while also going to school full-time in Boston. I'm very excited to uh, have a great co-founder with Anima uh, for this second company. So now I'd like to share a little bit more about my background from the beginning, now that I've given a top-level overview of what I've been through. And so from age zero to 10, um, I went through a whole bunch of formative experiences, of course. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania um, on August 14th, 1984. Uh, my dad uh, actually met my mom five years before that uh, in Sheffield, England. Um, he was there studying urban ministry there in Yorkshire, and my mom uh, and he met. She later came and visited him in, uh, in New England the next spring, and by November of uh, 1979, they were married. Five years later, I came around. Uh, we lived in a small apartment, actually uh, right above Mr. Rogers' uh, recording studio, if you remember Mr. Rogers' shows from the 80s and 90s. Um, and at age two, my dad got a new job as an Episcopalian uh, minister in a new church in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and we moved from Pittsburgh to Woonsocket. I lived there in Rhode Island from age two to age 10, went to uh, daycare, preschool, uh, elementary school for the first uh, five grades. And probably some of my more uh, significant memories are traveling to England often to see my family. Um, I remember my third birthday was actually my first memory there in England. Um, traveled to Europe when I was six for three months. My dad was, uh, had his 30th anniversary as a priest. Um, and so we got, he got three months off and we got to go to Spain and France and England and Switzerland and uh, took a month off of my first grade. And actually everyone would ask me, how can you take a month off of school and still learn? And I actually found out that by traveling, I learned so much more. And then when I was uh, nine, in fourth grade at Burning Heights Elementary, I remember winning the school geography bee and getting to participate in the Rhode Island State Geography Bee. And so from a young age, I knew uh, I was a little bit different. Um, uh, I knew I was uh, somewhat smart and uh, began taking an interest in geography uh, in, in the world around myself. And my parents really encouraged me to read and certainly enabled me to travel. Now, on a low salary, um, my mom uh, was a social worker but stopped working at the age of five and my dad was a minister 
um, together my parents made about $32,000 a year. We were still able to travel. Uh, my mom would save, she would do everything she could to make ends meet, uh, even shopping at uh, the PTA thrift store in order to uh, save enough money for us to have our uh, trip to, whether it be Europe or have a chance to go on a cruise every uh, couple years. So those are the first 10 years of my life, really formative times in which I learned about the importance of reading, importance of um, surrounding yourself with people from whom you can learn, uh, the importance of financial acumen and saving. I was very entrepreneurial from a young age and uh, I remember at the age of seven I had my first job doing the landscaping for our local church uh, where my dad uh, was priest of course and saved up $500 that summer, put it in a mutual fund and started learning about the effects of uh, compounding returns. Uh, the next year I went to CVS, the local convenience store, and purchased a whole bunch of American flags for 10 cents a piece and then would sell them for a quarter a piece in our front yard. And that was my first sort of uh, business where I invested in upfront in the inventory and then made a profit and was able to reinvest. Um, by age 10, um, when we moved down to Florida, I got, I'd received a computer from my Uncle Steve and that really set me up for my next entrepreneurial adventure. And so from in uh, December of 1994, uh, my family and I moved down to uh, Bradenton, Florida. We actually lived on an island called Anna Maria Island, a little, a little bit just off the coast of Bradenton, Florida, south of Tampa. Um, and I was finishing up fifth grade, going into sixth grade, and my uncle Steve, who at the time ran a company called Stratus Computing, um, sent me one of his Macintosh LC old computers. And I learned everything I could about that computer. I loved it. I played SimCity, played Cannon Fodder, I read everything I could uh, in PC World from cover to cover. And by that next summer, the summer of 1995, I wanted to start my own business. My mom uh, suggested that I start do something with computers since I had taken an interest in uh, these machines that could amazingly connect to the internet. And so I put up a, a flyer at the local laundromat, city hall, the library, and it said for $5 an hour, responsible 11-year-old will come to your house. Um, call Ryan at 776-4506 uh, or whatever my number was. And I didn't get a lot of calls for the first couple of weeks. Um, I remember putting up the flyer everywhere I could, even in people's mailboxes. And I finally got a call on my own landline, which back in 1995 was a big deal to have your own landline as, a, as an 11 or 12 year old. And it was my first call. And I picked up and the, the gentleman actually asked to speak with my parents. And so I put my mom on the line. She came back 30 seconds later and said, Ryan, uh, that was the Postmaster General and he was yelling at me for letting you put the flyers in people's mailboxes without paying for the 29 cent stamps. And that was the first lesson I learned about entrepreneurship and business, that sometimes you have to act first and ask for permission second um, if you're going to make it uh, as an entrepreneur. As long as you act within the golden rule, as long as you are doing unto others as you'd have done unto yourself, sometimes you have to push the boundaries a little bit. And so a couple weeks later, I finally got my first real call from I think a guy, a guy named Jim on 64th Street nearby there on Anna Maria Island. I rode my bike over, helped him for an hour with his computer, and got $10, a nice tip for the $5 an hour I uh, charged at the time. And the most important thing that I got from my first client was the next week he went to the bingo hall. And on Tuesday nights in Anna Maria, the bingo hall was where all the senior citizens went. And he told Betty, he told Francis, he told all his friends about this young whippersnapper, 11 or 12 year old that could come over and show you how to install AOL and do the amazing thing of sending a picture to your grandkids. And so I started getting lots of calls and I was in business. And that was my second important lesson about business and entrepreneurship. And that's if you do a good job, the word, word of mouth will spread. And word of mouth is the best type of advertising you can get in business because it's free and because most importantly, it's trusted. So as I was off to the races that summer of 1995, I made about $460 and I was able to go into seventh grade um, having uh, a couple uh, nice, nice shirts, nice clothes that I was proud to have purchased myself. And so I continued doing that for the next few years and eventually in 1998, one of my clients was a flight attendant by the name of Lois, Lois McDougall. And Lois would fly on the international routes on Northwest Airlines from New York or Tampa, uh, connecting through to Beijing. 
So she would go on these international routes to China. She started bringing back these international, or these freshwater pearls on those international routes and started selling them to her friends, pendants, earrings, rings. And one day she came up with the thought, why don't I just create a website? E-commerce was new, it was all the rage in 1998. And so she came to me actually and said, Ryan, could you build a website for me? And I had fortunately taken an HTML class in seventh grade at my middle school. And so I said, yes, absolutely, I'll take on that challenge. Built the website, freshwaterpearls.com. And over the course of the next nine months or so, uh, the website got up to selling about $5,000 a month worth of pearls. Um, eventually she shut down the business because she said it was a bit too much of a hassle to try to do both at the same time. And I learned the lesson uh, at that point, sort of my third important lesson about business, that if you don't build systems, if you don't hire people and train people and to build systems, which are just replicated processes that can be uh, completed over and over by people other than yourself, you often, as an entrepreneur, are just building yourself a job instead of building a company for yourself. And so I learned early on, as soon as you can to hire someone uh, rather than trying to take on all the responsibilities uh, oneself. And so I, the great the value I got there in the summer of 98 was I learned how to build websites, which was a fortunate time to learn that skill. Started going into high school um, as a website designer, as a graphic designer, and doing a lot of websites uh, for my high school and for a number of other clients there in Bradenton, Florida. And then Something happened, uh, I was reading this book called Guerrilla Marketing by J. Conrad Levinson, which is about low-cost techniques to generate sales and get publicity and get attention. And one of the suggestions in there, in uh, that book, was send out a press release. And so at the age of 17, I decided to just simply put a headline, subheadline, date stamp, city, state, who, what, where, when, a couple paragraphs, a couple made-up quotes and sent it out to local newspapers, which was the Bradenton Herald and the Sarasota Herald Tribune. And to my surprise, they wanted some positive news and they picked it up and ran on the front page of the Bradenton Herald in July 2001, when I was 17. And I uh, was fortunate to get a number of calls on my voice voicemail. Uh, it was actually an answering machine box that we would have uh, back in the day. And uh, one of them was from a guy named J.R. And JR had built a company there in Florida called ActiveX America. And he was about three years in. He had fallen off a horse, one of these uh, sort of racing horses, back in 1993. He had developed lower back pain and searched high and low for something that would naturally reduce his pain. Um, he tried probably all of the normal traditional medicines and he finally ran across uh, something that helped him called glucosamine. And what JR did is he created one of the first liquid glucosamine products which from his experience seemed to be absorbed better in the human body which helped make the joints move more easily. And so he created a company called ActiveX America which uh, sold his product which was called Synflex to primarily senior citizens who had osteoarthritis. And I came on effectively uh, as his first hire. And he put me in charge of website development and marketing. And over the course of that year, we grew from two employees to six employees, and the sales of the company grew from $1,000 a month in sales to $200,000 a month in sales during August 2001 to August 2002, before I went off to college at UNC. And so that was an amazing experience at the age of 17. I was taking the last couple hours of each day off of school, doing an internship at my high school there in Bradenton, Florida and was able to work about six or seven hours every day and learn all everything about internet marketing, search engine optimization, email marketing, affiliate marketing, display advertising, how to manage and optimize different channels, as well as a lot about just business, about how, how to hire people, how to let people go, do accounting, how to do payroll. And it really inspired me to want to start my own business. Rather than be a sole proprietor where I was selling my time on an hourly basis, I wanted to build a company that could operate with systems even if I wasn't present. Build a company that could make an impact on the world. Be, build a company that could could uh, grow to hundreds of employees. And so when I went off to college in the summer of 2002, I was really intrigued and soon thereafter started my own business. And so from the age of 18 um, to say 27, I was building a company called Eye Contact. I met my business partner, Aaron Houghton, uh, two months into school. And in the midst of calculus and statistics and accounting, I was excited to be working with him and being creative and working with more of my right brain. 
And so after the, uh, the first semester, uh, we started working together. My company, which at the time uh, was called Verante, partnered with his company, which was called Preation. And Verante was in charge of marketing and getting customers for the product we had built. And Preation was in charge of website design and website development and building out the programming. And so uh, the product that we had come up with was originally called IntelliContact Pro. And uh, later, after many years, we renamed it to IntelliContact and then to iContact. And what iContact did was it made it easy for anyone to use an internet browser, uh, like Internet Explorer or Mozilla or Opera or Firefox or Chrome, to manage their email list and send out and track the results of emails to uh, community members, um, to nonprofit donors, to political constituents, to whatever audience who had opted in to receive those emails. So it was permission-based email marketing. And we, we saw the opportunity because at the time, a lot of the tools that were available were downloadable desktop-based tools. And about every 10 years in the computer industry, a new paradigm takes place. And in 82, it was the command line. In 92, it's the graphical user interface. In 2002, it was software as a service. And of course, now in 2012, it's touch software. So we were taking advantage of that last major paradigm shift that happened about 10 years ago with web-based software. And we created one of the first web-based email list management tools. And so we began building the company, bootstrapped uh, the next summer of 2003 after my freshman year, lived in the office, slept on a futon, cooked on a George Foreman grill, did everything we could to keep our expenses low while we built up our revenues. And we bootstrapped for actually the first three years of the company, uh, got eye contact up to one and a half million dollars in annual sales, and then we raised our first outside round of capital. We had bootstrapped up to that point on just $5,000 of funds that a friend of ours named Wes provided to us for 1% uh, equity ownership in our company. And so in 2006, we had figured out something really important that I'm going to talk about later in these series when I get to my discussions on entrepreneurship and marketing. We figured out our unit economics. And what that means is we figured out how much it cost to acquire a new customer. We would take our total advertising spend and divide it by the total amount of new customers we would get, and that would be our customer acquisition cost. Once we figured out our customer acquisition cost and the amount of revenue customers would pay us over their life as a customer, which we called our lifetime value, uh, we had a simple mathematical formula that with additional funding, we could scale. And so we went out to Idea Fund Partners there in Durham, North Carolina, and raised our first seed round of funding in 2006. We used those funds to grow eye contact from one and a half million dollars in sales to six million dollars in sales in a year later when we went out to update our partners in Reston, Virginia and raised our Series A round of venture capital financing of 5.3 million dollars. Now we had real money and we could build out a truly professional executive team, really ramp up our online advertising which was at the time mostly Google AdWords, and really build out a professional, scalable, secure system. Uh, that could grow to hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of users. And so we used that capital very intelligently, sort of very mathematically driven all along the way. And by 2010, iContact got up to 170 employees and about $28 million in sales. We went out and raised our Series B round of funding from JMI Equity of Baltimore, Maryland. And we raised $40 million from JMI. And we used that capital to really build out the company for growth. And in 2011, we reached $38 million in revenue. And in, 2000, uh, excuse me, in 2010, we reached $38 million in revenue. In 2011, we, we reached $38 million, $48 million in revenue. And so going into 2012, we faced a number of strategic decisions. And coming to us was a company, a public company, uh, again in the mid-Atlantic region, uh, just south of Baltimore called Vocus. And what Vocus does is provide cloud-based marketing software, so internet-based marketing software to mid-market clients, companies generally between 10 and 500 employees. And they really wanted to create an integrated marketing suite. And so Vocus acquired iContact to get our email marketing and our social media marketing capabilities that we had built to get our 70,000 paying customers, to get our 48, 49 million dollars in revenue, and to uh, get our amazing team, which by then we had built up to 300 employees. And so that transaction happened uh, in February. And I'm going to sort of back up and tell a little bit more of the personal journey of the last couple years here. 
And so after that JMI equity fundraise in August of 2010, I was 20, 25, 26, just turned 26 actually, and uh, I was running a nearly 200 employee company that was growing at 50, 60% a year um, there in Durham or Raleigh, North Carolina. I was learning so much about building a company, about scaling marketing, about uh, hiring an executive team, about working with people who are twice and sometimes three times my age, about building uh, systems, processes, about how to build the right software and back end and security systems in to create a company that can actually grow to 300 employees. And I learned a lot of lessons uh, about operations management, about raising funding, about marketing, about branding that I'm going to share later on in this presentation during the section on business, which is part three. Um, over the last year and a half, I've definitely been through some personal struggles and challenges as well as uh, a number of uh, very fortunate events. Aaron and I often say that uh, what we did right was we surrounded ourselves at eye contact with amazing people who were smarter than ourselves. And it was really those people, our executive team, our seven person senior leadership team, and our other 30 or 40 managers in the company, and our 250 other team members that really did the heavy lifting to build eye contact into ultimately a, a big success. And so all through that process, I was growing quickly, I was learning, I was also um, dealing with a number of things that just happen to a lot of people from time to time that are just unpredictable things that life throws at you. Uh, a couple examples, uh, in uh, October 2009, um, my business partner Aaron came down with thyroid cancer and uh, together we decided that we would re-architect the purpose of the company, the values of the company. We wanted to create eye contact in a company where the values of the company were very much aligned with our personal values, which are to make a positive impact on the world and to use business and technology and integrated philanthropic systems to create a positive, scalable impact. And so we created at the time something called the Four Ones CSR program, in which I contact gave 1% of our equity, payroll, time, and product back to 501c3 nonprofits in our community that our employees selected, as well as globally. I started going to Africa about every six to 12 months to invest through the Humanity Fund in different uh, companies, whether it be a solar power company or a, uh, an incubator in Nairobi. Um, and I really continued to grow and learn as an individual. And probably the, the biggest challenge, uh, biggest couple challenges I faced were, uh, in the, again, in the fall of 2009, right after Aaron's cancer, we found out that there was a company, a public company, that almost acquired us, but then it right at the last minute backed away. And so from those challenges, we really, in 2010 and 2011, aligned eye contact into being a company we could be proud of, not just you doing philanthropy from an ad hoc standpoint whenever we chose to or whenever us as, as the majority shareholders decided, but a process through which the employees could participate where we could give on an ongoing basis. And then the final thing I'll mention is um, in the spring, sorry, excuse, excuse me, actually in the fall of 2011, in November of 2011, my mother, Pauline, uh, to whom this video is, is really dedicated, was diagnosed with a uh, fast-growing glioblastoma brain tumor right in the front, uh, the frontal left side of her brain. And she went from a normal, fully functional, healthy 59-year-old woman in November of 2011 to being uh, bedridden and unable to talk by February 2012. And so that was very hard for me to go through, particularly going through that at the same time as the Vocus transaction and, and the acquisition of eye contact. And so I learned a lot about um, suffering, about the value of suffering, about pain and dealing with pain, learned a lot about how to manage your time and how to ensure that you have a good team in place to take care of things when you can't always be there yourself because of more important things. So I learned many things and uh, after uh, being in North Carolina for nine years and after the sale of eye contact, I finished out my responsibilities with Focus and moved to San Francisco for the summer, this summer of 2012. And since May, I've been out here. Uh, this is actually a, a room in my house uh, here in San Francisco from which we're filming. And I met Anima, and Anima became my next co-founder. And today, we're building a new company called Connect, which is creating software that helps you visualize your connections, and helps you manage your personal relationships. And our big belief is that if you can better take care of your network, if you can better manage the relationships with the people who are already in your life, you can do great things. And so for people that are on a mission, for people that are, for whom their human capital and relationships are really important, uh, Connect is a great tool, and that's what we're building. And we're launching our alpha uh, here this week, and our beta will be out later in the fall. 
Uh, I uh, have had a lot of um, experiences leading up to eye contact in the last six months, leading up to Connect uh, being launched in the last six months. Most notably in May, I had a, a chance to go to Africa for the fifth time, visited a refugee camp in northwestern Kenya on the South Sudanese border, a place called Kakuma Refugee Camp that has 95,000 refugees. And there I ran into two refugees who actually had smartphones. Um, and when you start seeing smartphones in remote refugee camps on the South Sudanese border, you realize that you're only a few years away from supercomputers being in the pocket of nearly every human being. And I'm just amazed uh, by what tr uh, transformation we will see as a human species really in the next decade as smartphones go from being uh, in 20% of humanity's pocket today to 50% within two years to 80% within five years. Imagine a world in which every human being or nearly every human being can access the cloud, can access the web, can access the internet and all the information and educational resources uh, that are present there. I'm excited about that world coming soon. And so at Connect, we're building software that is uh, that works and helps connect people on mobile touch devices. Um, so that has been my experience and in about six days I'm off to Boston, Massachusetts to Cambridge to begin my first year at Harvard Business School. I'm very excited about uh, that two-year program. I'm going to learn a lot about finance and operations and marketing and technology and leadership and uh, certainly I've learned a, a bit uh, over the last nine or ten years growing eye contact um, but I know I have a lot more to learn and so that's one of the reasons I'm doing the video here today to download my brain uh, before I go off to grad school so I can prepare to learn so much more. And so the things that I'm passionate about that I'm going to talk about throughout the rest of this presentation and video series creating a world without poverty, the role of science and technology and business in making the world better how we as a species, how we as a generation can create a truly sustainable world. Um, create a world in which every human being has access to their basic human needs. Food, water, shelter, medicine, education, electricity, sanitation, and the internet. Basic human needs that I think everyone should have access to and I think we actually have the ability to make that happen in our lifetime in the next 30 to 40 years. How, also, I'm going to be talking about building great companies with great cultures and how we as Gen Y leaders and managers like to take a different take on perhaps a traditional uh, managerial uh, role that was played in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Talking about internal psychology, the mind, internal mastery, and things like meditation. I'm going to talk about international development and global, globalization. I'm going to talk about travel exploration, and I'm going to talk about public service, government, and politics. So these are the topics I'm passionate about, and I'm looking forward to sharing more in the videos ahead.